In gaming, two years stand out above all others as the industry's most important, 1998 and 2001. Both of these years not only saw the release of games still heralded as some of the best of all time, but also introduced innovative new mechanics that we now take for granted as game design standards. And for what it's worth, almost 10% of all the games listed on Wikipedia's list of video games considered the best page are from these two years. In 1998, the console gaming world was only about two years deep into true 3D gaming. And quite frankly, nobody really knew what they were doing. It felt like most developers were just feeling their way around this newfound third dimension after virtually perfecting the 2D formula. Some attempts in the 3D space were legendary and genre-defining. Others were serviceable, and still others were downright awful. In 98, Insomniac and Sony gave their answer to Super Mario 64 with their own open-world 3D adventure, Spyro the Dragon, which was a solid game in its own right. N64 Kids also had a great year with Gex Enter the Gecko and the classic collectathon Banjo Kazooie. My uncle made the mistake of showing me Parasite Eve, which gave me nightmares for weeks, and that one kid in your neighborhood who actually had a Dreamcast got to play Sonic Adventure. Thief Blaze Trails is the first first-person stealth game, and the first game that used light and shadow as a game mechanic. Resident Evil 2 improved every aspect of the first installment and cemented Capcom as the best in the biz when it came to survival horror. But five games released in 1998 made this year one of the most important in gaming. They are Metal Gear Solid, Half-Life, StarCraft, Pokemon Red and Blue, and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Each of these games not only introduced brand new storytelling elements, design mechanics, or gameplay loops, but honed them to near perfection. Anyone going with me? As usual, this is a one-man infiltration mission. Weapons and equipment OSP? Yes. This is a top-secret black op. Don't expect any official support. Before Metal Gear Solid, there really wasn't such a thing as a 3D stealth action game. Sure, I mean, some games required you to sneak around, technically Pac-Man is a stealth game, but none were so refined, so eminently enjoyable as Hideo Kojima's dark and brooding masterpiece. I mean, I still remember playing the Metal Gear Solid demo at my buddy's house and reacting to the guard recognizing Snake's footprints in the snow. Huh? Whose footprints are these? The story was dark and mature, with just a streak of off-color humor. It had enough fourth wall breaking to disorient you without taking you out of the experience. You like Castlevania, don't you? It invented a new radar mechanic that lets you see your enemy's field of view and sneak your way to your objective. There was truly nothing like it. And I remember thinking several times while playing through it, are you really allowed to do that in a video game? <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. First-person shooters up to this point were simple. They often provided a forgettable, superficial story, or no story at all. That all changed with Half-Life. Half-Life not only dared to tell a fully realized sci-fi story, but also introduced a new way of storytelling in games, using environmental cues and non-player characters to deliver exposition without taking control away from the player. For once, we aren't given story beats through scripted cutscenes, but we actually experienced a multi-layered sci-fi narrative of conspiracy, betrayal, and mystery through controlled gameplay. There's just something so haunting and arresting about the lore of the Half-Life universe. Not to mention the shooting mechanics, which, while they still have an understandable level of jank, hold up endearingly well even 25 years later, as players both literally and figuratively went deeper into the dark, conspiratorial world of Black Mesa. They were constantly introduced to new environments, new puzzles, and new enemy types, which kept the game fresh and exciting to the very end. Half-Life changed the first first-person shooter genre forever, and that it actually gave shooters permission to say something meaningful. Wisely done, Mr. Freeman. I will see you up ahead. Now, StarCraft didn't invent the real-time strategy genre, but it certainly perfected it. The gameplay was deep and nuanced with unprecedented strategic depth and a rock-solid multiplayer experience. The three distinct factions, each with their own unique units and abilities, created an ebb and flow to battles that RTS games would seek to emulate for years to come. Now, This was back in the Blizzard Golden Era, 
so the production values were second to none. The story was compelling, with fully voiced cutscenes that furthered the narrative between missions. The voice acting was, of course, iconic, with quotes like, Yes, sir. Orders received. Not enough minerals. Still living rent-free in my brain decades later. And while StarCraft may not have invented the RTS genre, it's likely the reason esports exists at all today. It's hard to overstate how important StarCraft is in gaming. It's still played competitively at a professional level nearly 25 years later. Red and Blue were the first Pokemon games to be released in the West, and they are still some of the best. The original 151 Pokemon were nothing short of iconic. The gameplay loop was perfect. Not too easy, but also not so hard that my little seven-year-old brain couldn't understand. But aside from the gameplay itself, Red and Blue played another important role jump-starting the absolute cultural chokehold that Pokemon had in the West in the late 90s. Pokemon is an undeniable obsession with children across the country. It was inescapable. Every kid I knew was either playing the card game, playing the Game Boy games, or obsessing over the show. It was a true phenomenon. And then there's The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, which is not only the best game on the Nintendo 64, but quite possibly the best video game ever made. Ocarina of Time took everything great about the 2D Zelda franchises and extrapolated it to a third dimension. But not to be overshadowed by its quality were the design mechanics that Ocarina of Time introduced to gaming. It popularized the now ubiquitous 3D open world sandbox. The Z-targeting lock-on mechanic, which we now take for granted by the way, would become the standard for 3D action games. The soundtrack is my personal favorite of all time and what I believe to be composer Koji Kondo's magnum opus. Every piece is perfect, from the dynamic overworld theme which changed based on certain game conditions to the dulcet tones of Surya's song. Those who follow my channel know that I'm primarily a video game music content creator and Koji Kondo is my favorite composer not in just video game music, but of all time. The game features some of the best dungeon designs in any Zelda game, an addicting combat system, and an emotionally resonant story. It's simply beyond compare. Now each of these five games would be, and often still are, held up as gold standards for their respective genres. Thousands of developers and game studios would tirelessly seek to emulate, improve upon, or pay homage to the ideas put forth in these titles. Now, I was eight years old in 1998. Even in my little underdeveloped brain, I was convinced that gaming had peaked and we couldn't go any higher. That is, until 2001. By 2001, it's safe to say we'd found our footing in 3D gaming. Nintendo and Microsoft finally got their Gen 6 consoles out the door, Sony eked theirs out in October of the previous year, and those of us who could afford it, or had rich friends, were blessed by the holy trinity of the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and GameCube. And boy, was this a great year for console gaming. You had games like Super Smash Bros. Melee on the GameCube, which improved upon every aspect of the original Super Smash Bros. with incredible art design, a huge roster of characters, and a fighting system so deep it's still being exploited today, not to mention being played competitively in the fighting game community. Final Fantasy X continued the series' legacy with a rich storyline and classic turn-based combat wrapped up in some of the most gorgeous graphics and art design ever seen in a video game. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty took the stealth action genre to new heights with mind-bending storytelling, characters still talked about today, obsessive attention to detail, and incredible graphics for its time. Sonic Adventure 2 took everything the first did, made it better, and then actually put it on a console that people actually bought. Sorry, Dreamcast fans. And Jack and Daxter gave Sony fans a nice little Gen 6 open world platformer. Going to the PC for a second, Max Payne introduced bullet time shooting mechanics in a neo-noir narrative style. Serious Sam, despite the irony of that title, took the opposite path from Half-Life and made a gloriously gory and arcadey first person shooter for people who just want to shut their brains off. On the GameCube, Animal Crossing was a deviously addicting life sim and one of the first games that followed real life times and seasons to offer the player unique gameplay experiences. Fun fact, this was the first game that I ever stayed up all night playing. I'm talking 24 hours, zero sleep, and no, I didn't cheat and set my clock forward. And Advance Wars gave handheld gamers an approachable and fun on-ramp to tactical turn-based strategy games. And yes, we're still just in the year 2001. But the most important, genre-defining, history-making games of the year were without question Grand Theft Auto 3 and Halo Combat Evolved. Grand Theft Auto 3 took the top-down 2D hijinks of the first two games and turned them into a full 
3D open world crime sandbox. Other games before GTA 3 were technically open world, but not like this. For the first time ever in a video game, you didn't feel like you were playing a video game. You felt like you were living in Liberty City. It was incredible, and still is to this day. You could go through the story and accomplish all the missions, or you could just hijack cars and drive around, indiscriminately fire weapons into crowds, or spawn a tank and use it to fly across the city. Nobody had seen an open world with this level of depth before. And the fact that Rockstar was even able to get a game of this size onto a PS2 disc is a modern marvel. Now as far as Halo goes, what can be said about Combat Evolve that has yet to be said on the internet many times over? It popularized console FPS gaming. It's responsible for the Xbox's success as a platform, and it set the standard for split-screen multiplayer experiences. Halo CE was simply lightning in a bottle. It was the perfect storm of great art design, tight shooting mechanics, combat loops that never got boring, and ever-evolving enemy types that made the game feel fresh until the very end. And that's not even counting the story, which has spawned a whole universe of sci-fi lore that's on par with some of the biggest flagship sci-fi franchises in modern pop culture. Halo CE was, and still is, the archetypal console shooter. It's one of those rare games that's just as good today as it was when it came out over 20 years ago. And I just recently played through the game on Legendary and got to taste that same feeling I had when I picked up that Xbox controller as a little kid. So, when we crusty old gamers opine for the golden era of gaming, are we simply blinded by nostalgia? Am I misremembering these experiences, or have we really just not been able to recapture the magic of this era? 1998 and 2001 were truly special times for gaming, and in the era of microtransactions, Fortnite skins, and loot boxes, we may never see another time like it again.